right. Thank you so much. Welcome to an episode of the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. I'm the author of Love Hope Lime with family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. And of course, I'm the host of this podcast. Thank you so much for listening today. You can find the book on Amazon. Dr. Harwitz, I've made the e-version of the book free for chronic Lyme survivors. If you'd like to get a free e-version, the PDF, reach out to me via Facebook or, or LinkedIn, or go to freddiamond.com and I will send it out to you. Dr. Harwitz, I've sent probably a thousand e-versions of the book out free for chronic Lyme survivors. So here's the scoop. When I wrote the book about 18 months ago, I met some amazing leaders in the Lyme community, doctors, medical practitioners, charity directors, and they've helped me to understand what living with Lyme is all about. On the podcast, I've invited them to share their insights into how you can support those you love. If you're a chronic Lyme survivor, the podcast will help you understand how you can let your family and friends support you, how you need to be supported. We transcribe every episode. You can find all the back episodes at freddiamond.com. Click on the Love Hope Lime button. And of course, they're all available wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, et cetera. All right, so let's get started today. My guest today is, is Dr. Richard Harwitz. He's known for a lot of things. He's also known for How Can I Get Better? It's a fabulous book. You know, Dr. Harwitz, in the summer of 2021, when I just dove in deep, I got your book, How Can I Get Better? I also got the predecessor to that book as well and read it from cover to cover and was just blown away by how much I didn't know about Lyme. I just want to acknowledge you also very kindly wrote the foreword to my book. It was written uh, passionately. It was written very uh, with a lot of care. So I just want to thank you for that. And uh, it's an honor to have you on today's show. A lot of people in the Lyme world know you. And when they saw that you had written the foreword, they were very impressed by that. So, so kudos and thank you so much. So let's just get started right here. So what are the three things family members, partners, and friends need to know about what their loved one is going through? So I think the most important thing that people need to know about chronic Lyme disease is that it's a real illness. It's not in their head. Uh, what we're starting to see now with people with uh, long COVID is they're getting gaslighted. And it's a very similar situation that we've seen with chronic Lyme for over 40 years, which is uh, people have a lot of symptoms. It's subjective rich, but objective poor, meaning you feel a lot of these symptoms, but you don't always find physical characteristics, right? Except if you happen to have a bullseye rash or something else that happens to prove you have it. So people need to know that, first of all, it's not in their head. This is a very severe illness. Um, a lot of these patients that I see are the worst of the worst. They've usually gone to 10, 20, 30 doctors. Um, the most I've ever seen is someone who went to 100 physicians before seeing me. And it's primarily because the general medical community um, still is confused at this point as far as the, the diagnosis and treatment of this very difficult disease. So um, I would say the most important things is it's not in people's head. It's a real illness. It's very severe. And especially when you're dealing with your loved ones, you need to know that they're going to have good days and bad days with ups and downs. So um, a lot of people, I think, get their hope up. They start to see you know, some relief of symptoms with certain treatments that people may be doing. And then they may have a couple of days or weeks or even months sometimes where people crash. And you have to kind of get used to the idea that this is going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride until the provider that you're working with is going to unravel the illness um, into all the component parts. And as you mentioned with my book, you know, How Can I Get Better? An Action Plan for Treating Resistant Lyme and Chronic Disease. I have a 16 point model. And we find that in this uh, 16 point model, the vast majority of my patients have at least eight or 10 of the MSIDS factors keeping them ill. So, you know, it's a long process. It takes time to unravel the illness, uh, to address each one of these abnormalities, whether they have Babesia, Bartonella, but, but people need to know that it does take time. You need to be patient. You need to have compassion, right, for your, your sick and suffering uh, loved ones, but that there is hope that in fact, solutions do exist and we're coming up with better solutions pretty much every year as we're discovering new treatments for Lyme with uh, persistent biofilm forms and also treatments for Bartonella. Curious on how you got, how you committed your career to this. So you're kind of a Renaissance man. You've also written some uh, very uh, interesting science fiction book, which I read from cover to cover. And uh, you've been featured on some of the some of the um, some of the documentaries uh, that are uh, out right now on Lyme disease, and you know, uh, 
like I said, so many people have reached out to me when they saw that you had written the forward to my book. And to be honest with you, Dr. Dr. Horowitz, I didn't really know much about Lyme disease 18 months ago when I decided to learn more about someone uh, close to me to understand what they were going through. Could you give us just a brief overview on why you've committed your career to Lyme disease? And, and you know, the, there are too many people who go to medical school to become a, a Lyme doctor, you know, the term Lyme literate medical doctor. Uh, how do you get to this particular place? And give us a little bit of a peek into why you've committed your life and your career to this. So in a sense, it was by accident. I had finished my medical training in Brussels after seven years of doing um, a seven-year program in French. I then came back to the United States and did my internal medicine residency at Mount Sinai. And I was deciding at that point after finishing my three years at Sinai, did I want to open up in Bayside, Queens, where my parents were? Uh, did I want to move upstate? I was being given an offer by Vassar Hospital to help me open up a medical practice. Uh, the thing that kind of convinced me to move upstate a bit, and again, upstate meaning just about two hours north of New York City in Hyde Park, was that at the time I had been studying with the Tibetan Buddhist lamas for uh, about 30 years, and I decided that I want to continue my meditation and my spiritual training, and there happened to have been a monastery and a Tibetan lama who was literally a few minutes from Vassar Hospital. So it was kind of a nice a kind of mix for me of kind of continuing my spirituality, um, getting my meditation practice set, being close enough that I could still visit my mom in, in Whitestone. And uh, so it, it actually worked out quite well. But when I moved up and I asked Lama Norla, um, you know, what do you think about my coming up here? He said, very good. Um, and of course, I didn't realize there was an epidemic of Lyme. So the, the reason I really got into it is just that there was a need for patients who were suffering. When I was finishing medical school, I had gone to Lama Gendon Rinpoche, one of my spiritual teachers who gave me refuge. And I asked him what was the most important thing he wanted me to know getting out of med school. And he said, compassion, put yourself in people's shoes, do for them what you would want done for yourself and everything will go well. And, you know, although I would have considered myself a nice person and a good person, I'm not sure after kind of delving into Lyme with all the controversies, because when I started getting into this, which I moved up here in 1987, um, you know, it, it was really not well known what was going on. There were essentially two standards of care at that point, the IDSA and other doctors, I, ILADS hadn't been formed. I was one of the forming uh, founding members, but there was a lot of confusion out there. And the medical boards were quite aggressive going after doctors who did not follow IDSA guidelines. So um, it was a bit of a mess actually early on. And the thing that kind of kept me going forward to help these patients was constantly the advice of my spiritual teacher of, Put yourself in people's shoes and do for them what you would want done. And, and basically, uh, it's worked out, I must say, extremely well over the years. In fact, my wife, who I had met um, several years after being up here, she ended up having chronic Lyme disease. Uh, she had been sick for 25 years before even seeing me. And my wife is now four years in full remission after doing the double dose Dapsone protocol that I've published in the medical literature a couple of years back. So, um, it, you know, it, you could call it kismet, you could call it fate, karma, whatever you want to call it. I was in, I guess, the right place at the right time. And my motivation was such with my training that becoming a medical detective and an internist, I was kind of in the right place at the right time to help people. So you talked about the word compassion, one word I've heard a lot. Uh, I also, a lot of people know I do a, a very popular sales podcast called the Sales Game Changers podcast. And one of the most popular words that we've had uttered in the over 600 episodes I've done on that show is empathy. So touch on if, if you only do one thing, again, family members, partners, and friends, if you only do one thing, what is the best way to support your loved one who's a chronic Lyme survivor? Um, you actually pretty much just nailed it. I mean, actually the best thing to do is listen to them and have empathy because um, it's very difficult to put yourself in someone's shoes when they don't necessarily look ill, right? They, they may look actually fine, but they're chronically tired. They can barely get out of bed. They have terrible brain fog, aches and pains all over their body. You really do need to have empathy and compassion for your partner. Um, and, you know, service, you know, in, in, in many traditions, serving others and doing the best to help others is really a form of spiritual practice and, and a way to kind of elevate, in fact, your soul's mission. And um, for me, it, it really has fit with who I am. And fortunately for myself, you know, it was easy for my wife because we kind of fell in love the minute we met, but it really was not easy being with someone who had chronic Lyme, who was sick, 
who could not, you know, necessarily shop and do all the things that I would have hoped, you know, sometimes it would have gotten help with because she was ill. So, you know, listen carefully, listen to what they need. Um, you, you have to trust your partner. You have to know that what they're asking you for is real. Um, it's not some form of manipulation. They really are ill. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of healthcare providers know themselves because their wives and family members have gotten sick. And many of the doctors I've trained themselves have gotten Lyme. Right. So I think they even become better practitioners because they know firsthand what people are going through. And it's much easier to develop empathy and compassion once you yourself have experienced this illness. So I, I'd say that probably is the most important thing is just put put aside your prejudices, just listen very carefully with an open mind um, and just, you know, figure out how can I help? How can I make a difference? How can I support you? That That's probably the most important thing you could do. No, that's a great point. I mean, one of the quotes I've seen a lot is you don't get it until you get it. But obviously, you don't want to wish Lyme upon anybody. Uh, what shouldn't they be doing? What are some things that you see people doing, uh, spouses, partners, friends, whatever it might be, that they're doing that you say to yourself, you know, I wish they wouldn't be doing that or that your patients have said to you, you know, I'm glad that he or she is paying attention, but I really wish that they wouldn't be doing this. I think the most difficult thing for um someone who's living with someone who's ill is to try and kind of create a framework in a box for them that you need to do this. You you must do this. Come on, baby. You got to get out of bed today. You, you got to go to work. You got to exercise. Like you want to kind of push them out of the right motivation, right? To do things that you think will be best for their health. But that's kind of where your significant other needs to be kind of coordinating with your healthcare practitioner and finding out from the doctor who's treating them, right? What are they really capable of doing? Where, where should I push? Where can I put like a gentle hand in your back very gently to say, please, darling, try and get up today and maybe just take a 10 minute walk. Like you have to understand that it's got to be a gentle push. It can't be anything in your mind that you want them to be better quickly, and you're just going to kind of force the issue. I think that's probably the worst thing you can do for people. Um, and especially a lot of people get frustrated and they get angry, right, at their partners because they're not getting their needs met, right? And you have to be very clear in relationship that it's not really the the person who you're with. It's not always their responsibility to take care of all of your needs. You have to find your own way to find balance in your life where um, you have your own love and fulfillment, it doesn't always have to be with the person that you're with. It's beautiful if it can be, um, but you can't always expect that to happen. And, and know that, you know, sometimes in life, we're going to be giving to others more than we're going to be getting back. The balance in relationships may not always be 50-50, at least for a while, but in a sense, karma is perfect. Whatever you give is going to come back and whatever beautiful things and support and love and um, you give to someone else, it's going to come back to you in one way, shape, or form. But you need the big picture in mind. You can't, you can't do this day to day and just kind of be frustrated and be angry. You really need to keep an open mind and look at the big picture. That it's going to take a while to get over this illness. Oh, that's a great point. I mean, uh, I run a business and I'm very prescriptive in how I need to manage the business. And uh, you can't manage someone else's health care that way and say, OK, you know, in two weeks, you're going to be at this particular place because this is the plan and the plan is going to get us there. So we're talking today with Dr. Richard Horowitz. It's the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. Dr. Horowitz, before I ask you for your final thought, um, a final message here for for the for the uh, for the family members, partners and friends, what should they expect? You know, you just gave a little bit of that where it's it's not a prescriptive journey, as I just said, and there's not a time frame. You know, uh, one analogy that I've heard people say is if, if you break an ankle, every orthopedic surgeon on the planet is going to put you on a cast for six weeks. And then you're going to sit on the couch and watch reruns of loss for two weeks. And then you're going to do a little bit of rehab and you're going to be fine. Lyme doesn't work that way. So give us some more insights into what should family members, partners and friends uh, expect their loved one's journey to look to look like as it continues. I mean, most of the time, what people can expect is kind of a roller coaster ride because people are going to have good days and bad days. Uh, they may have a couple of good days or weeks where they're really feeling well and then may have a horrible Herxheimer reaction when you're killing off the spirochetes or, or the Bartonella's flaring up. So it's it's really important to understand it is going to be a roller coaster ride. Don't, don't expect like just because your partner is well one day, they're going to wake up the next day and feel exactly the same because you can start to get your hopes up. And then your hopes get dashed because why aren't they well? Why is it taking so long? Um, depending on how long they've been sick, how many overlapping MSIDs factors, how bad their Bartonella Babesia is, 
um, how well they tolerate persister drugs like dapsone disulfiram. There's a lot of reasons why people are going to have these ups and downs, but you've just got to expect it's not going to be a straight line from, you know, an A to B to get these people better. And I, I think it's important to kind of realize this journey is a, it's a long-term journey. For some, by the way, I've gotten patients better in two months. They've done a Dapsone protocol. They had a couple of things wrong with them and they're great. And for others, it can take years just because they've been sick for so long or they have so many like difficult overlapping factors. I want to ask you one final question that was just uh, reminded of myself before I ask you for your final tip. I saw you do a, a webinar. I think it was for the Pennsylvania Lyme Disease Association or something. It might have been a year ago. And, you know, you talked about everything that you just talked about and covered a lot of the things uh, in your book. And by the way, uh, I recommend that people get, uh, if you are interested in supporting someone that you love with chronic Lyme disease, to get How Can I Get Better? It's it's a long book, but every page was like an aha moment, like, ah, now I understand that. And wow, it just talked about all these aspects and it is a very complex disease. So I, I highly recommend that people uh, jump up on Amazon right now and get How Can I Get Better? When I heard you do that webinar, you mentioned at the very end, it was almost a throwaway line and, and our discussion right now just triggered this. You said, and if you don't address childhood trauma, you're never gonna recover. Uh, could you talk about that in, not too long, but in the concept, context of what we're talking about here for family members and friends. Why did you say that? How critical is addressing childhood trauma to be able to recover from such a disease as Lyme? And then we're gonna wrap up and I'll ask you for your final thought. Well, the patients that I see who are chronically ill, who are really, really ill, most of them have had childhood trauma. Um, and I've, I've had my own childhood trauma, so has my wife. I mean, many of us just living on this planet, things happen, right? So what happens with the immune system, what I've noticed in people is depending on the type of trauma, um, whether it's physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, you've got to dive down and you've got to get to this because the people who really are the most difficult people to treat in my practice are the ones that have very severe depression, very severe anxiety. And a lot of times it's from that trauma that is just unresolved. They may have issues in their life right now that you know needs healing. Bond correctly as if people's immune system says, well, there must be something wrong with me. I don't deserve to get better. And so I, I suggest that people do things like EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapy. There's lots of good now vagal limbic retrainings with the Annie Hopper dynamic rule training, the Gupta techniques, the Rosenberg techniques. There are many different ways that people can heal from trauma, but you need to know that it's an essential part of the equation because of the way the mind body works. And, you know, you don't have to be kind of new agey at this point to understand that your immune system, the way it functions, this has been, you know, published in medicine in good journals. Your immune system is directly going to respond, right, to what kind of trauma you've had. Um, so I, I really do suggest for people that have had a difficult time early on or going through trauma right now, you need to be in the care of a, of a therapist, a psychologist, sometimes a psychiatrist. Um, and there are things you can do at home with meditation, vagal and limbic retraining. Um, but don't leave it aside. Don't think, oh, it's just taking antibiotics or herbs from my Lyme and, and I'm going to get better. It's really an essential part of the equation to get people better. All right. Once again, I want to acknowledge you, Dr. Harwitz, for just an amazing career in helping probably hundreds of thousands of people, not just with your books, but with your practice, with your speaking, your support of, of all the documentaries that are out there, the quiet epidemic, et cetera. And uh, just, uh, I just want to acknowledge you for, for what you've done in your career to, to help so many people uh, heal get more out of their lives and, and find love. Like we talked to him in my book, uh, Love, Hope, Lyme with family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. Thank you for writing the forward. Give us a final thought, something to leave us on here as we wrap up today's podcast. Um, really, my final thought is just, I would advise people to get your book, Fred. there's probably been enough attention put to this. So I think you're filling in an essential gap for people and for the Lyme uh, world. So I want to thank you for writing the book and taking the time. And um, I, I'd say at this point, right, get your book, read it and, and learn how you can support someone who's ill. Um, it fulfills your life. I found that the greatest happiness I have is when other people 
um, are happy and healthy from what I've done. That brings me the greatest happiness. Um, and I think you'll find that when you're a, a provider taking care of someone who's ill and they do get better and you've played an important role, that sense of fulfillment, of love, of um, the difference you've made in someone's life, it, it's really um, something that kind of fills your heart with fulfillment. And it's it's so important, both for yourself and for your loved ones. Well, like you said in the forward to my book, where there is love, there is hope with proper medical treatment. Once again, my name is Fred Diamond. This is the Love, Hope, Wine podcast. I want to thank Dr. Richard Harwitz for being on today's show. Thank you and take care.